Um, and, uh, and what a great book. Did, has, did everyone get their book signed? Yeah? Um, this is Phil, by the way. Say hi, Phil. Hi, Phil. Thank you. Um, and he wrote this book, which I, um, I, I got to read before. Let's sit down for a couple. So we're going to get you guys involved quickly, but uh, has anyone actually read the book already? Did somebody? Some, no. Good. So we're going to get, give you a little overview of what it is, and then we're going to get you involved, and, uh, because I think this has a lot of implications both for, uh, for government. So um, it's called, the book is called The Age of the Platform. What is a platform? What does this mean? Well, to me, a platform is just an integrated set of planks, which, of course, begs the question, what's a plank? But in writing this book, it was really important to me to define my terms. I, I want to say that it was Winston Churchill who said success begins with a common understanding of terms. So Everyone looked at Paul. Paul's an enormous Winston Churchill fan. Okay. So he's, gonna, he's actually fact-checking yeah, right Yeah, somebody now, Google so. it. Um, <laughs> uh, but I found that a lot of people were using the term platform not necessarily wrong, but in an inconsistent fashion. So if you watch a show like Bloomberg West, which I watch fairly religiously, I joke with my friends that there must be some sort of bell on the show, and every five minutes someone just goes to platform. Um, so if you look at what Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google have done, they really transformed their companies into these platforms. And by adding the different planks, they have had so much success in building out these ecosystems. So um, for instance, in 1998, Google wasn't a platform, the way I define it. It was an amazingly powerful search engine. It became a platform. Well, how did it do it? It added Plus and YouTube and Gmail and Reader and Docs and all these different planks. So if every site on the internet were inaccessible except for Google, I could get a lot of things done. To me, that's a true platform. And uh, one of the quotes from your book that I, I took down, and, uh, and I think the government folks will, will relate to this, in general, the gang of four, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Google, and who am I forgetting? Apple. Apple. Um, yeah, I know them. Um, it, you say uh, they're doing what top management gurus have been espousing for years. Specifically, these companies are embracing intelligent risk, just like the government does, right? Um, they aren't afraid of failure, experimentation, and change. Yes. Talk about how they do that. Well, they realize that it's, I don't want to say silly to have a five-year plan, but nobody can possibly predict the future. So let's take a look at Google, for instance, and Google Plus has been very successful. It hit something like 50 million users in record time. But people forget that this is Google's fourth bite at the apple, right? You had Orkut, which I think launched in the mid-2000s, which was only popular in Brazil. Don't ask me why. Uh, then you had Google Wave, which was kind of complex and confusing and not everyone understood it. And then there was Google Buzz, which was sort of an overreach and got Google in a lot of trouble. And finally, they launched Google Plus. So Google understands that to have a social plank in its platform is essential these days. In other words, I don't want people to go off of Google, if I'm Larry or Sergey, if they want to be social. Right? That's not to say that Google Plus will surpass Facebook that has an 800 million user lead, but it doesn't have to. The point is you can be social with Google. And that's just something that these companies understand. They don't necessarily know where things will be in five years. And one of the points I make towards the end of the book is that none of these companies can predict the future, right? The leaders are really smart, you know, Jeff Bezos and, and formerly Steve Jobs. But when the future arrives, they're going to be in better positions because of their platforms. And describe why these people should care about platforms. Why do platforms matter? Do you, go, do you set out to build a platform? Yes, that's not to say that every company or organization should, but... I argue in the book that companies with vibrant platforms and ecosystems and communities out there, you know, open APIs or application programming interfaces, encouraging people to build off of these platforms are going to be in much better places. Uh, there's an example in the book of um, Twitter, a company called TweetDeck. Twitter, just by way of background, makes its API application programming interface available, basically letting devices talk to each other, right, creating web services. There are something like a million different apps based off of Twitter. Okay, so let's say that 95% of them aren't very good or they don't work or they're redundant. Okay, fine. 5%, 50,000 of them that possibly can do something useful. So TweetDeck came along and built. Does anyone show of hands use TweetDeck or Hootsuite, similar service? Okay, a few hands. If you just look at, if you go to twitter.com forward slash Phil Simon, you'll see a stream of my tweets. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, but with Hootsuite or with TweetDeck, you can segment them. You can track keywords. You can track 
handles. You can track trends. So it segments it, right? You might follow 2,000 people on Twitter, but if you're like me, maybe you have your sports heroes or your music heroes on a stream. Okay, so Twitter came along and bought TweetJack for 40 to $50 million. So this is Twitter saying, hey, you took our product or service in a different direction that's useful to us. This is a company that cashed out. The same principle is at play, Chris, when you think about the App Store, right? Steve Jobs is obviously a very smart guy. I'm fairly certain, though, that he didn't say, and once we build this App Store, someone's going to download Angry Birds 20 million times. So the beauty of the platform is that you can embrace, to your point, this uncertainty. You're putting, there's this engineering concept I discuss in the book called dynamic stability, right? So if you get on a plane, the plane is hopefully stable, but it's also in motion. That's exactly what these platforms do. They will evolve, but it requires, I think, this letting go. You're embracing external innovation. You're making products and services available to the public at large, and you may not like the directions that they take things. But there's always that risk, and I just think that in business and the way government's going with budget cuts, you're going to have to embrace that type of risk. There is such a thing as intelligent risk. Uh, Don Tapscott, in his uh, original book, which now seems like about 300 years Was ago. Was it 2004? Uh, 2003. We actually had him. We introduced him to the government market, mm -hmm. Ann and I did, and, and Wikonomics is the book. And he talks about that loss of control, that what happens is these are really – uh, all these tools, and now we're seeing it with mobile devices, yes. are, are essentially, you, you lose control at every step. Um, for the government folks out there, that freaks them out. How do you deal with that? <laughs> get, get ready to be I, freaked I, out, right? I, I guess what's the alternative? I mean, again, not to get all political here, but to me, regardless of where you sit on the right or the left or in the center or none of the above, you know, to me, government will have fewer resources, financial and human, to get the same work done. So how do you do that? To me, platforms and ecosystems are about mitigating that risk. You're putting an API out there. You're putting a software development kit or SDK out there. Someone could build an app or a tool or a product or a service that's actually useful. And if not, what does it cost you, right? So I have an app in the App Store for my last book, The New Small. And it didn't take that much to develop, and it did get approved. So for Apple, the risk is basically zero. Right? They have some people who approved it and make sure that there was, there was no virus or it wasn't objectionable material. If the app does really well, then Apple's going to make 30%, and then I make the other 70%. So to me, it's about, it, it, I mean, I actually quote um, Tapscott in the book. It is about crowdsourcing. It is about losing control. And I guess that if we lived in different economic times, you could try to keep it all reined in. I just don't see how that's possible to me. There's no guarantee that these four companies, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, will be around, much less as prominent. Right? I mean, if you go back six or seven years, right, who were the big tech companies? Well, AOL, right, Yahoo, MySpace. No one's talking about them now. If you're a hot developer, you want to work for Zynga or Google or Apple. You don't necessarily want to work there. So these platforms have to keep evolving. You know, I give the guys at Google a lot of credit because they are making billions of dollars from search, yet they are changing their business model. They're experimenting and they're taking their platform in all these different directions. And it's not because they aren't successful. Uh, you've heard of Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma? Mm -hmm. for, those, yeah, who, for those of you who don't know, the basic premise is that successful companies and organizations have this fundamental problem. They're successful, and they don't want to change, yet they put these big targets on their back because they're successful. So Steve Jobs, in his book, writes about being cannibalized. Do you want to do that to yourself, or do you want your competition to do it to you? I think that it's a rhetorical question. You chose four companies to sort of demonstrate this, and there are a couple companies, big names. You mentioned a couple, but there's also another company that's up in up in Seattle, mm -hmm. near Seattle, that didn't make the list. How, how, why are these four ones that we should pay, pay attention to? Well, there's nothing wrong with Microsoft, and I assume you're talking about that. Oh one, yeah, right? that's I couldn't remember. It. Yeah, um, but if you look at these four companies, and there's a chart in Chapter Two of the book that sort of lays out the differences between platforms in the mid '90s and platforms now, because to me, the platform isn't a new concept. To my knowledge, I'm the only person who's written a book looking at the platform as a new and important business model, and also looking at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Uh, the reason that I chose not to focus on uh, Amazon, Amazon or Microsoft, Chris, is that they tend to be more of a B2B or enterprise brand. Right in the mid '90s, when I first started working in sort of corporate IT, you used Microsoft products because you basically had to. Right? What was the choice? Was there really a mainstream alternative to Windows? I would argue no. Ditto Microsoft Office. The four companies, the gang of four that I profile in the book, are all consumer oriented. Okay. If I had everyone stand up, you want to try this? This is actually kind of fun. 
Everyone stand up. This is fun. You'll be sitting in 30 seconds. <laughs> I love doing this. Okay. If you use Amazon at all, have a seat. Wow. How about Apple? I want to talk to those people. You don't use Amazon at all? Okay. Wow. How about Apple? Have a seat. Facebook? Have a seat. Google? Have a seat. Wow. You were the first. I've done this a few times. You were the first person to stamp up after all four. So if I were to name... What do you have in the cave? <laughs> <laughs> Just asking. Right. But, but not, not to pick on you, but you're the exception that proves the rule, <laughs> right? Most people use one or two or three or four of those companies, and I would be hard-pressed to name four other companies that had such reach. So when I was writing the book, two things nearly got me injured. A, I was or working on the manuscript, and I saw a Google alert come by with Eric Schmidt, uh, who was at the time CEO of Google, now he's the chairman of the board, talking about four companies executing platform strategies really well, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Now, I don't think that Google spies on me, but I did kind of think, wait a minute, wait, is this guy looking at this? Do you use Google Docs? I, I, I do. Uh, there you go. Um, but then I, I was on a treadmill. I'm just saying. About two months ago, I live in Las Vegas, I was on a treadmill at the gym, and Fast Company a couple of weeks ago put out its uh, cover, Who Will Win the Great Tech War of 2012? And they had pictures of the leaders of the Gang of Four. And I damn near fell off the treadmill. So I'm not the only person, I think, who believes that these four companies are doing things exceptionally well. To my knowledge, um, I think I'm the only person who wrote a book about all of them, even though I've read many books about the individual companies. So to me, these companies are not unattainable. You can learn. You know, I've, I've gotten into arguments with people. They say, come on, I run a 10-person shop. You're telling me I can learn something from Google. I'm saying, yes, it's only a matter of scale because as a small business owner, one, I work as an independent consultant, speaker, and writer. I've embraced some of, some of these concepts. So if I can do it, I, I just don't buy that other people can't do it. I think they may not want to do it, but that's a different discussion. We're talking mobile today. It, it, connect these with the mobile because all of them have some kind of mobile connections. Absolutely. How is that important? Why does mobile matter? It absolutely matters. There's no coincidence that in the age of the platform, we take our computing experience with us. I no longer have to be on a platform right in front of my desk. If you go back to the mid-90s, people tended to access the best technology, or even the internet for that matter, in front of a desktop or a laptop. You did it at work. Right? The IT has been consumerized, so now something like 300 million people every day log into Facebook on a mobile device. That's astonishing. Uh, people, uh, iPads are becoming more popular. Tablets, now there's a number two with the Kindle Fire. So people are taking their platforms with them all the time. And the genius of someone like Jeff Bezos to me is not that he's figuring out a way to lose 13 to $50 on each unit of the Fire sold, which is what some people estimate. The genius is that people are going to use it as basically a loss leader, right? It's the old, uh, I think it was the Norelco model, right? Give them the razor, but sell them the blades. Right? So even if he takes a loss on the Kindle, you're going to buy books and movies and music and beef jerky and all these different things on your Kindle. So mobility changes everything. That guy's not. <laughs> um, the, uh, I just, I'm, I'm like that. Uh, um, the platform and government. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, who's widely credited with coining the, the term Web 2.0, um, is now out there and he talks a lot about government as a platform. And I sent you a bunch of stories where he talks about that. Um, and, and the idea of government as a platform is, okay, make all this data open and allow people to use it, and all of a sudden it becomes more important to... Why does that... Does that matter? Did, when I sent you the story of government as a platform, does that ring true to you? It does ring true to me because there's tremendous opportunity. And if you mean you can Google top 10, I sent you a link this morning, top 10 apps for the government. You have the one with the TSA. Certainly there are transit apps, uh, different ones for just the White House. But it's not just about saying, oh, we're going to be a platform now, right? You really want to incentivize your partners, right? Again, hot developers can work anywhere. Do they have the development tools, right, APIs and SDKs, and then do they have the incentives, Okay, It isn't simply about saying, okay, we're a platform now. I don't buy it. To me, Netflix isn't a platform because you can't build anything on top of it. Right? You want your community, your ecosystem, to take your platform in different directions. Some of them may not always be good. Right? But again, the, the genius of the Gang of Four is that they're smart enough to realize they're not that smart. Right? I, I completely agree with you on Tapscott's point about crowdsourcing. You don't know what's going to evolve when you make some of these ecosystems open. 
but if you don't give the developers the tools and the in incentives, I'm not sure that developers are going to spend hundreds of hours building a cool app, maybe out of some kind of patriotism, but there has to be something in it for them. So if they can build a better widget or mouse chap and do it cheaper, and they have skills that you don't, I guess there is a downside, but to me the pros outweigh the cons. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I got to unveil, uh, EPA has done this apps for the environment uh, contest where they made all sorts of data available and, and then um, had people build applications on it. One of them uh, was uh, an app that you can download. In fact, it's a web app too, so you don't even need an iDevice um, that will tell you the um, UV index that in the taps into your location and tells you that today would be great to see what the UV index is. Um, another one is called uh, Hoot, uh, Hoot Walk, I believe, okay. and, and you can, uh, it'll tell you the, the most environmentally friendly way to get from point A to point B, and it just overlays it on a, green, on a uh, Google map and, and tells you how much, um, how much CO2 you're using. Pretty cool stuff, all using data that the government has and just made available. It sounds so easy, just make the data available, and yet it's not that easy, is it? Or is it that easy? How well, do, I don't how do you necessarily get to the place where you're thinking in pla about platforms. Sure. Well, I don't necessarily think, Chris, that it's a binary. We have to make all of the data available. We have to make none of the data available. If you're trying a proof of concept, for instance, you may want to make a subset of the data available, part of it, dummy data, just see if it would conceivably work. You know, going back to the Gang of Four, they don't make everything available all the time, and I'll give you two examples. First up, Google, when it launched Google Plus wasn't really sure about how it would be received. Again, Google had three other bites of the apple with regard to social networking and didn't do very well. So Google put it out there in a limited version, a limited basis, and it gained some traction. They got some feedback. They made some changes. Okay, then they opened it up to everybody. They also recently made some of the APIs available to Google+. Plus. So if you want to do different things with Google+, Plus now, in theory, you can. And the other example, I think, that comes to mind is Amazon. Now, I, I noticed you flagged a few things, and I think a couple people with Kindle now, you can share part of the book directly on Twitter, which was kind of neat. Um, Amazon also has a program called Add Author. So if you want to ask the author of a book on a Kindle, if they participate in the program, a question directly, basically circumventing Twitter, you can do that. But again, it's on a limited basis. So no one's saying that you have to make an enormous data set available to everybody all at once. I mean, there are legitimate security reasons that you could argue you shouldn't make a certain avail data available. But I think that there are gradations. You can certainly throw things out there. We were talking before about that book, Little Bets, uh, by Peter Sims, which, which I quote in the book as well. So looking at it as, well, everything's available or nothing's available, I think misses out on some of the gradations that are certainly possible. Uh, I want to tap the wisdom of crowds in a second, but uh, talk a little bit because I'm, I'm picking up vibes that they're saying, okay, I'm the General Services Administration. I'm the USDA. I don't see how I can be like Facebook. We're, what we do is completely different. Okay. And you might not, but someone else might. That's, that's the whole point. Um, who, again, who would have thought that Angry Birds would have been so successful? I mean, now a company or a Farmville and Zynga, Zynga's uh, products, Mafia Wars. I mean, in hindsight, it might make sense, but who would have known that going in? So there is this notion of uncertainty. I just think that the times in which we live, I, again, to me, in the age of the platform, the costs of inaction exceed the costs of action. That's a broad statement, but I think that it's generally true. But as I was reading the book, uh, what came through over and over again to me is that this is almost more a mindset than anything yes. else. You have to, uh, uh, my phrase, just, well, Nike, I think, did it first. Just do it. Mm -hmm. and, and these folks all just did it. And, and realize that not everything was going to work. And, and that's harder in the world that we all live in. Understood. But again, what's the alternative? Uh, I don't see government budgets going up anytime soon uh, based on what's happening across the country right now. In fact, I think it was Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a couple months ago, was the ninth municipality to default. I mean, that's what if that, those types of Wisconsin type scenarios start happening all over the place. So if the platform allows you to do things faster, better, cheaper, I would counter that that's something you should be looking into, even though, to your point, that there certainly are risks, and I don't mean to poo-poo them. I'm not up here saying that all companies ought to make all data available. In fact, the Gang of Four does not. Uh, Facebook will turn off an API. Right? They don't let you Google within Facebook. Or Apple is another example of not an entirely open system. There, there was a controversy. They're control freaks, right? 
Well, uh, I wouldn't say software. control freaks because anyone can submit an app to the App Store. And there is an approval process, but Steve Jobs didn't want there to be a whole bunch of junk in there. And, and Amazon, I think, is taking a similar approach with the Fire. Amazon selected a carefully curated list of apps based off of a version of Android. So if you look at the Gang of Four, it's not like they're all totally open either. Right? They all have, as I said, gradations of being open. So when I'm saying that every company or organization can learn from Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, no one's saying that you know, Google doesn't make its search algorithm openly available for obvious reasons. So these companies, to varying extents, are also partially closed. Um, I want to read other, one other point which I thought was uh, very relevant to this audience. Um, the Gang of Four, they need to constantly reevaluate and redefine basic precepts such as what they're currently doing, how they do it, what, uh, what they do it with, with whom they do it, and how each piece interacts with other parts of its ecosystem and the world at large. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Business today won't be the same as it is in six months or a year. Uh, Google, just as an example, now is tying every employee bonus to success in the social sphere. Why? Some pe Google has something like 67, 68% of the market share for search. Some companies would be complacent with that. Google isn't one of them. Google realizes that social search, and particularly Facebook, are enormous threats. And I'll give you a per perfect example. I recently bought a MacBook Pro. And I had had a PC for years and years. Um, and I asked my friends on Facebook, thinking of buying a Mac, what do you think? Now, my friends, however you define them on Facebook, know me a little better than Google. So my friends all responded with, you're a geek. You will love a Mac. And they were right. So there's a search that I did on Facebook that I didn't do on Google. It's not that I couldn't have done on Google, right? You can find discussion forums, Mac-specific ones. There are articles. In fact, there are books that compare the two. But again, that's a search that I did there. So if Google isn't being complacent and they're what, one of the top three or four most valuable companies in the world, why should any other company be complacent or organization for that matter? Uh, let's talk to... Uh, so you hear about platforms. What do you think? What do you... As you hear this... Who's going to be my first one? Ah, yay. You win a prize by asking the first question, by the way. I'd like to get a cover. Yeah. I'm Ian Thompson. I'm with Agilex, and uh, we work exclusively with government, helping with some of these problems on the mobile front. And it seems like the service to the citizen, unlocking that data and providing some of that to the citizen for information through mobile applications is effective, low-hanging fruit kind of way to, to get in. But because the government is stewards of citizens' data, and a lot of their missions are, you know, highly secure, like in the DOD space and Homeland space, et cetera. Um, there's um, a lot of policy gets layered over what they can and can't do, and it, 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 it slows the speed of innovation. And it's a really a legitimate concern in terms of driving um, efficiencies at the mission level, and I think that's holding some government agencies back. Can you comment a little bit on what you might recommend in terms of using policy to enable this intelligent risk taking, uh, I think that could help everybody out. Thank you. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, my phrase always is I think a lot of feds are more victims of bureaucracy than they are purveyors of it. They have to live in this world that everyone's created. But I know, I, I know people who work at Google, and there's a bureaucracy there too. There is, but. In fact, one of the first things that Larry Page did when he took over as CEO for Schmidt, and I think it was early June of, of this year, was to reorganize. Because to your point, he was realizing that things were getting too bureaucratic. There were policies that were inhibiting innovation within Google. So he restructured things. They rely less upon email and policies. In fact, now he wants to have more conversations so people actually get stuff done. Because today, you can't be inhibited by those things. I wish I had a simple answer to your question. Um, but if it's easier for a company like Google because it isn't a democracy, right? One of the things I talk about in the book is that the Gang of Four all benefited from having these iconic and visionary leaders, right? I mean, Jeff Bezos angers a lot of people, right? Steve Jobs, if you read the Isaacson biography, which some people probably shouldn't read because we have this idyllic notion of him as this game changer. He was a horrible person. But and he was I usually owned right. everything he made, but he, but was, he was usually right. And because of that, <laughs> he was able to get away with things that if he were usually wrong, he would have been ousted from Apple and never would have come back. So we wouldn't have some of the products that we're using today. 
I, I wish that I had a simple answer to your question. Those companies do benefit because they can force things through. If Mark Zuckerberg says, I don't care if by introducing the timeline or changing the policies around privacy, I'm going to anger people. I have a long-term vision in place. That, I think, buys him some credibility. Again, that is, to me, Facebook, the perfect example of want to versus have to. Again, going back to uh, companies like Microsoft in the mid-90s, nothing against Microsoft, but you use them because there was basically no other choice. There are other social networks out there. You don't have to be on Facebook. So having this long-term vision is mind, in mind, I think, is easier said than done. Uh, but I have, you know, when, we, when Chris and I talked about my speaking here today, I, I wish that I was smart enough to tell you if you follow these three or four bullets or this 10-point checklist, then that's exactly what will happen. You know, read the book, and, and because of your different background than mine, you may get some ideas because, to me, this book could have been 600 pages. There's just so much going on. To me, the Gang of Four has really introduced this fundamentally new business model, but I completely agree with you. It's a lot easier for a company to tell its partner, right, to shut off an API, to reject an app, to tell its, its employees this is the way we're doing things, and if you don't like it, leave, than someone like yourself who has to interact with different levels of government, different policies. So I, I agree, that, that's a big challenge, and I, I wish I were smart enough to tell you the five things you should do. And one other big difference is, and I think it's similar to what, it, with all four of those folks, there is one or there is a decider, um, and in government, um, there's two sides of Pennsylvania Avenue, for goodness sakes, and then a lot of people involved with that. It, it's very – how important is it to have that person who says, okay, the person who says we, this is the direction we're going in? Well, it's an interesting dichotomy because here I am talking about the importance of iconic and visionary leaders and how this isn't a democracy, and five minutes ago I'm talking about crowdsourcing, Right. So how do I reconcile these two ostensibly conflicting notions? And I don't think there is necessarily a conflict because if you have someone sort of steering the ship, right, you're saying, okay, I'm going to build an app store. I'm going to make APIs available. I want people to develop apps on top of my platform, but I don't necessarily want to be people to do it because I don't know what's going to be popular. You could put out, you know, I think there's this myth that the best apps or the best platform will win um, because there may be better bookstores than Amazon. But if Amazon has every book out there, why do I want to spend, in, in, a, in an age of harried consumers, hours and hours trying to find something that's 50 cents less, right? So by building up that infrastructure and having basically every book available, Amazon became the de facto play. In fact, the first question I asked, how many people use Amazon, 75% of the people sat down. So, again, this, this is a big idea book, um, and one of the things I'm most proud of, Chris, is that there isn't a checklist there. I don't know the ten things that you should do to be the next Google, and I would argue that if Google were starting out today as smart as Larry and Sergey are, Google wouldn't even be Google. There is something to be said for luck. One of the things you talk about this in, uh, is the Arab Spring, and we've seen so much go a couple weeks ago, I was talk and I called it the Irish Spring, which is a completely different thing, by the way. Um, They'll get me in trouble. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we've seen these tools and all of these companies' tools, uh, all of them actually, uh, being used in, in ways that have fomented enormous changes in the world. We don't know whether they're good or bad yet. Um, and again, kind of kind of scary. Um, the 99% people are, are out front and are going to march somewhere today in the rain, I guess. Um, but there's, it, there's a lot of, I think, concern that, you know, Congress has 16 percent approval ratings. That's good for nobody. And, and at least my point to folks is, like you, what, what do we got to lose? Well, if it wouldn't be Facebook or Twitter spurring a revolution in Syria or Libya, then I would argue it would be something else because the technology is marching that way. That's not to discredit what the guys at Twitter or, or what Mark Zuckerberg has done at Facebook, but... To me, it's almost like blaming Craig Newmark of Craigslist for killing ads in the newspaper industry. If you want to blame him, that's fine, but someone would have done it eventually. Right? So to me, there's this inevitability of the technology. People want to connect. Again, no one has to use Twitter or Facebook, but they do it because they have something to say. Now, you could argue that Twitter is good or bad and overflowing these governments was good or bad. I don't want to get into that argument, but I guess the point is that it's going to happen anyway. So it's like the Marines say, you can follow, you can get out of the way, or you can leave. And technology f does find a way. That's one of the things that we've really found over the last couple of years is, guess what? You can put all these policies in place, but in, in a lot of agencies I know uh, for a long time blocked all those, all those 
face, face, my whatever. Um, and, and guess what? People just went on their phones and did it. Exactly. Or People else. will fly under the radar, and there are two, um, two things that I want to talk about. A, in, in the corporate setting, I do a lot of consulting with, with corporate clients. If you block access to, or you say to people, you have to use Microsoft Project. And people go, oh, I don't like it. It's clunky. It takes too slow. It's not web-based, blah, blah, blah. So there are tools like Basecamp from 37 Signals that will let you basically do online project management on a limited basis for free. So people will find a way to fly under the radar, even if there are, to your point, policies. And then also, let's not forget the millennials. I, I heard the statistic the other day that something like 56% of all millennials would quit their jobs within two weeks if they didn't have access to their social networks. And, and to your point, if you block it on a PC through WebSense, then people will find a different way. So things are moving in an more open direction, I guess, whether you like it or not. And the question is, in this new environment, do you want to be the person fighting it or do you want to be the person trying to exist and profit from it? Uh, I saw a great uh, yeah I saw a great site the other day uh, eleven sounds that a kids born today won't will never hear it's like the dial of a um, and and I actually used the f one of the phrases I was talking to somebody and I said I sound like a broken record and my little son who's six he has no idea what a record was hi hi. hi. Uh, Tom Dickinson, uh, Department of Defense. Um, I'm academically trained as a historian, so I have to ask this question. Tying into your comment before uh, about the dangers of complacency and how these companies may be vulnerable. Today is the 70th anniversary of the attacks on Pearl Harbor. We knew then, back then, you know, that the Japanese were building up a huge navy. We knew that they had aircraft carriers. We knew that it was a mobile force. We knew that they were on the move. They'd been in Manchuria for four years up to that point. Have you ever thought about what might be out there that could bring these companies to their knees based on this complacency factor where, you know, a year later people would say, oh, gee, we should have seen that coming. We should have known that this was going to happen. But something, whatever it might be, that, that could, you know, cripple these companies in a real serious way? Yes, Smarty Pants, what don't we know? Absolutely. I mean, again, going back to Google with social search, Google is paranoid about that, and I think they have every reason to be, you know, it's amazing to me, uh, Tom, that a company like Amazon, which I was reading, uh, did, was doing during Cyber Monday 120 transactions a second, mind-boggling, is still worried about other types of companies, even though it has gotten to this point. So and when I think about threats, I actually think a lot about people. And I have this kind of weird background of a, a technical upbringing but then I have a master's in labor relations, so I like to think I know something about people. The brain drain that could happen from these companies after people are worth millions of dollars, I think, is potentially a challenge. Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce.com, was recently on Charlie Rose, and everyone's talking about high national unemployment. He's saying, that may be, but I can't hire enough engineers. So when a company like Facebook is forced to go public, they're talking about March to uh, June of 2012 because of an SEC rule about 500 private shareholders. Basically, Facebook, unless this law passes, may have to go public. And if it does, then you're going to have people who have options that will be able to cash out and those people go someplace else. So I think that rather than external threats like security, and I don't want to get off on a tangent, but they shouldn't be minimized, you know, the people are driving this. You know, there's, I think, a reason that Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google are so successful. It's, you know, it, when you think about it, who would have bet on Facebook, right? This is a, a project of a Harvard dropout that wound up uniting 850 million people. It's not like he had initially the best technology. I think that Zuckerberg had one of the best ideas and one of the best visions. At age 22 or 23 years old, when most people are trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, Zuckerberg wasn't saying, I want to build a cool website, I want to build a cool company. If you read Kirkpatrick's book, The Facebook Effect, he says that Zuckerberg was obsessed with building a great platform. To me, just genius. I want, I want to ask you a question. So as you hear about platforms, um, DOD talks about platforms in, in, all the time, but in slightly different ways. Um, so when you hear platforms and when you hear this discussion, what does it mean to you? It's, it's much different than what I've heard this morning. I mean, you know, because a lot of these things that you're talking about, I mean, they're not, they're not part of the corporate consciousness, I guess. You know, I mean, the Defense Department is a huge organization, obviously, with many components and lots of, you know, moving wheels and so on. But it's, it's like any government organization. It's driven a lot by policy. And policy, you know, is, is, is it, it 
it's hard to change, you know. I mean, it's, it, it builds up its own momentum and it goes forward and it's very difficult to change in the kind of, like, you know, the speed that you're talking about and the way these, these companies operate and the way platforms are defined here. So it's kind of a, there's kind of a clash of cultures there. So what's the biggest challenge from, uh, um, from getting from the world you live in to this kind of world, is, assuming that's where we want to be? It's, it's flexibility. It's being able to change. It's being able to, you know, a, adapt and adopt and, and move forward and, and be aware and alert as to what's going on outside the DOD environment. I mean, it, it's, it's tough. And you don't want to lose those key people because the developers, the people who are extending these ecosystem, they're building the apps or the tools or the services, they like seeing their products in action. They, they don't want it to say, oh, yeah, well, we'll look at it in six months at the next steering committee. That's, I think that's going to be a big problem. Um, and, and there is a lot of innovation even going on. At, uh, uh, the Army did apps for the Army where they actually had frontline soldiers who, who, guess what, have their iPhones out there um, and develop tools that folks can use. So there is a lot of innovation going on e even in government. So Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jerry Fries. I'm with, um, let's just say, a bureau within the Treasury. Um, you collect money from us. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> and everybody loves you. Nobody's left yet, but they will soon. Uh, my question is that you brought, um, alluded to it earlier, and that was the problem that government has with um, we, we can't lead the pack. I mean, we, the taxpayer is not going to give us the right or does not want to state risk. But we normally follow the, the, the movements, if you will, you know, moving to a mobile phone or something. The problem we have is that we have restrictions that let's take for instance Facebook. There are a lot of good reasons why the government does not want everybody to use Facebook that works at the government. You know, I mean, uh, if you're an NSA, well, you sure don't want them to know who, who you are. How, or do you have any thoughts on how the government can influence these innovative people to, to make it so we can use it? In other words, you know, we, they have to acknowledge that we have restraints that in order for us to use it, you have to adapt. Is it, do you know what I'm saying? I know the Facebook issue is one of the biggest ones where the White House was all uptight about, you know, well, we can't give out too much information. And they wanted to, I think there was a direct confrontation with Facebook as to, you've got to include, Im improve your security in order for us to use it, or we're not going to. And Facebook just said, we don't care. Are, are you on Facebook? As an individual, yes. But I don't access it from my work. Well... <laughs> Um, and, and, and I'm going to translate, and you tell me if I did a good job. Uh, the, the government in the enterprise world, before consumer, consumerization of all this, the government was the largest market any place. The government decided to go someplace, they could help shape that market. Um, COBOL, for an example, as he just said. Um, right now, Facebook has told the government, okay, yeah, go ahead and do your little government thing. That's not what we're doing. And, and this is kind of scary to these folks. Um, the federal government still does spend $80 billion on technology out there, but probably not with much with Facebook. But So how do you uh, – reaction. Did I capture it okay? Yeah, again, the issue is how do we – what method do we use to get them to adjust what they're doing so we can use it? That's a nice softball question, huh? Um, let's, let me say this. Uh, you're right. Uh, Facebook doesn't have to do anything. And I can't say that the Department of Defense is incorrect for not wanting people to be on Facebook because Facebook controls that data. Facebook's going to go public with, in all likelihood, a valuation of $100 billion. Why? Well, it's because it has this incredible trove of data on 850 million people. And, but it's, hey, Facebook isn't alone. Amazon, Apple, these companies have incredible incredibly accurate customer lists, right? In fact, um, there's an interesting example with Apple and the New York Times app, and Jobs got into um, um, an argument, um, which wasn't uncommon for him, with the head of the New York Times because he, uh, Steve Jobs, wanted to control the customer information. And ultimately, he won because he said, well, I won't put you on the iPad, and you know, what are you going to do? So I can't tell you that you're wrong uh, because Facebook would have that information, and Facebook is a, you know, an individual company can do whatever it wants. Perhaps there's a way to work with Facebook because the infrastructure that Facebook has developed, I think, is incredibly valuable, and I'm obviously not the only person who thinks so. So is there a way to 
work with them in such a way that maybe the gov that particular department has more control over its data or over its privacy settings because to build out a social, look, you can build your own private social network, right? There's a company called Ning that will let you set up your own private social network. And if that's something you want to do because you want to control the data, then there's certainly merit in doing it. Just understand that to add the functionality that Facebook has is going to take some time and some money. So I think that's a very uh, difficult question to answer because Facebook doesn't have to do anything. It seems to be doing reasonably fine on its own. Yep. Have these companies gotten too big to fail or too big to cooperate? Well, I think they're two different questions because remember, MySpace had, I think, 70 or 100 million users, and now it's an afterthought, right? I mean, who talks about MySpace anymore? Yahoo. Justin Timberlake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Yahoo is at kind of a crossroads. What does it want to be? Um, so it's hard for me to say that. Again, Google, we could see, I don't think they're too big to fail because on a mobile device, this is an interesting statistic, something like only 1% of all time on a mobile device is spent doing a traditional index search. People are using apps, they're chatting, they're texting, they're on the phone. So with the world going to mobile, which is a key theme of this conference, Google understands that. You know, that's why it develops Android and has apps, sports. Google still wants to be relevant. I think that if you look at the history of technology, like uh, I think it was Tom mentioned, name me, of the initial 100 companies founded on the New York Stock Exchange, last time I checked, only nine are still around. So could Google be irrelevant in three or four years? The answer is yes, and they know that. The same way, and Microsoft certainly is irrelevant, but Microsoft isn't as powerful, particularly in the consumer space, as it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And Microsoft's struggle is to become more relevant. That's why it's opening up 75 retail stores and is trying to do something with the tablet. So I don't see how you can say that these companies are too big to fail. Um, and, and there are, are people who have gotten together when they've been upset at Facebook about something. And people, you as one person may not be able to make a change. But when people got together, all of a sudden you had 100 million people, 100,000, whatever, uh, angry at Facebook about some change that they made. And... Facebook does start paying attention to those kinds of things. Well, it's funny because in the book I tell the story of a couple of years ago, there was a Philadelphia Eagles employee who had some disparaging marks to say about management on Facebook. And the Eagles management found out and they fired him. So what did his wife do? Started a Facebook group to get my husband her job back. So you can organize through these social networks very quickly. And to your point about the Arab Spring, I think that the power for people to organize right now has never been stronger and I don't see how that's going away. So, um, again, if Facebook were to drop the ball or enough people were to say, you know what, I've, I'm sick of the, the changes in the GUI or the privacy policies or whatever, then it's not in inconceivable for another ecosystem to evolve another platform. In fact, in the book, I talk about emerging platforms, Force.com, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, WordPress. And I'm not that smart. I, I can't predict the future. Something is coming now that if we're talking next year, and I hope we are, say, wow, we didn't see that one coming. Um. Oh, it, Jerome? Sure. Jerry. Uh, mentioned uh, that he's on Facebook but not for work. Um, one, of the, uh, m uh, one of the potential, I think, for government uh, as platform is to tap into people like Jerry and create a place where they can share ideas with other, other people in a safe way. Um, and it may not be on Facebook. Um, I'm, I'm affiliated with a site called GovLoop, um, and I do some work for them. Um, which is a, a, a social network, knowledge network for, for government people. It seems like that is one of the potentials here, where all of a sudden Jerry has great ideas about how to change the world uh, within his world. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? It, does that yeah, the, the potential to use these platforms to collaborate is absolutely amazing. Too often in the corporate setting, people rely on email. Right, I just was reading about a company based in France that has an 18-month plan to eliminate internal emails because it just becomes unmanageable. I love that story. Right? When you think about the insanity of most corporate environments, this is not lost on me. You can Google, I don't know how many billion, 30, 40 billion web pages in 0.5 seconds to get exactly what you want, but how many people here have been in the situation where, where is that Word document? Right? And it's insane. Right? So I think part of it is, to your point, a mindset change of getting away from the traditional, you know, email is still the killer app, and I get it, and I send a lot of emails. But if you've had three or four emails, maybe it's time to start a chat. Maybe it's time to start video Skype or pick up the phone, go old school. 
You know, even with Google, they say we rely too much on email. Let's get people together and brainstorm and throw things out there because the world changes too quickly. So I, I do think the potential to collaborate is enormous. Bob Petrie, URS. Uh, one of the things, on USA.gov has a whole bunch of apps that are government apps, but unfortunately some of them are I, uh, Apple and some are Android. And because unless you have both platforms, you can't utilize both of them, which I think that gets to be one of the problems, I guess, for government to uh, develop uh, APIs that people would actually want to use. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the TSA one is also a web app, so you, all, all you need is a browser from, from your device. But it's the challenge is which, which platform do I go? It's an interesting question, and I would say that you should date before you get married. For instance, when I had my app developed for my last book, we said, well, why don't we start with iOS for Apple? And if it does well, then we'll look at other platforms. We'll look at Android or we'll look at maybe RIM. And that app is in Angry Birds. <laughs> so it hasn't sold enough copies for me to invest the time and the money to go in that direction. But again, I don't know until I try. And one of the reasons I think there's plenty to learn from all these companies, regardless of the size of your department or your organization, is that I, as a single person LLC, have learned lessons from these companies. So you know, if you're trying to predict the future and you're afraid of doing something because you may be wrong, that's, I think, exactly the wrong mindset. Again, there is such a thing as intelligent risk. All of these companies are making bets. Some are going to be right, some are going to be wrong. More often, they're right than wrong, but if your organization mentality is such that people are crucified for getting things wrong, I think you're really going to struggle. I don't see, I don't see Martha. I'm just checking on my time. What, do you know what time we're at? 9.30. Okay. Um, I realize you... Have taken your shoes off? I have, because oh. they're soaked. Yeah. Um, I realize you don't want to predict the future, but we've got the four. Where do you see a fifth coming from? Can you guess another platform, another company? MySpace, right? <laughs> Friendster. I mean, you have these emerging platforms like WordPress and Adobe and Force.com. Um, I'm hard pressed. Rather than predicting a fifth, I think we actually may see additional consolidation. So I think that the days of sort of the standalone company are, if not coming to an end, but going to be increasingly difficult. So when Netflix sort of dropped the ball and, and its stock has gone down, I think, 60% this year, that, that's been a real challenge for them because if I can watch movies and content and TV shows on Amazon and Apple and Google and, and who knows what Facebook will do, why do I want to pay the money for Netflix? So I think that these platforms actually will become stronger, but again, I'm, I'm not smart enough to say this will be number five. Uh, I just... I can't possibly predict that, but there will be one. I, that much I do know. Uh, we're going to close out, and I'm going to ask you um, what, what one thing do you want people to walk away f uh, uh, knowing from this book? But before we do, I mentioned a prize, and, um, and unfortunately I didn't, had, didn't have your book before, but in a, a couple months I'm going to do uh, one of my Doorback Insider book clubs. Um, and, and the book, uh, you actually, uh, we were talking about it before, it's a book called Little Bets, and by Peter... Sims, Sims right. right? I get it right. And about sm taking, doing small steps to that actually make things happen. Um, and I think it's tied into the platform. It's actually in the back of your book too. You recommend it? Yeah, it's 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 a good read. It's about experimentation, and not just with emerging companies, but in the book, Sims talks about Procter and Gamble. They have a C and D or Connect and Deploy program, or Connect and Develop, and they make kind of like the outsourcing model with um, uh, Tapscott's book. They will put needs for innovation on their website yeah. because they want the community to respond to those needs. In, in terms of parting words, I would just say this. Well, hold on, hold on. Let me give my, my prize first. I'll, I'll give you a chance. Uh, so um, send me a note, and I'll, I'll send you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, you're not the only one. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to give Jerry one, too. Um, and I'll send you the date when this is going to happen because we're going to have uh, the author of the book um, and also... Um, an, uh, another Peter, Peter Levin from the CTO of VA, uh, who loves the book, and he's going to come and talk to, with us about it as well. So uh, this is coming up in a couple months. We're working out details. Getting two Peters on the same page is not no small feat. What do you want people to take, uh, take away from this book? Google didn't become Google overnight, and Google now isn't the same of Google 1998. Facebook didn't start off with 850 million users. It started off with one. And Facebook, like all these platforms, benefited from something called network effects. In other words, if you're the only person with a fax machine, the only person with a cell phone, the only person connected to the Internet, who cares because it doesn't scale? 
but with network effects, Facebook was able to add the second million users quicker than the first million users. So this takes time, and you may not see progress for the first six months or so, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. So there is this uh, belief in what you're doing, and it's the right course of action. There may be a long-term strategy, but in the course of the long term, these companies have all made adjustments, and they've all failed spectacularly. I mean, if anyone's ever remembered Facebook Beacon, when Facebook thought that it would offer this new service by telling people what the credit card purchases they were making and posting it on their profiles. Well, you had people, right, you'd have a wife who'd go, honey, who'd you buy a diamond necklace for? <laughs> it was a mistress. So these companies have screwed up royally. True story, yeah, Google Facebook Beacon, you'll know what I'm talking about. So these companies at different points have all screwed up royally, but they've had many more successes, and they haven't been afraid to say, this is the wrong direction, or even though we're successful, we're going to have to go in a different direction, and who knows where it would take them. No one would have thought in 1995 that Amazon, just as an example, would make, and this is true, $750 million this year in pure profit from selling excess compute power to small businesses through Amazon Web Services. So if you embrace the platforms, you don't know where it's going to go. And that scares some people, but it's also, I think, really exciting. Um, uh, these days, it is the uh, best of times. It's the worst of times in this uh, space. As I don't have to tell you what the worst of times are. You know all that. You're living that. Um, but I also think it's some of the best of times because a lot of those third rails that you guys have had to deal with for a long time, there are, there are no sacred cows anymore. Um, things, you're, you're going to have, I hope this isn't a shock, you're going to have less money next year than you did this and probably less money the year after that. And Can I be deep for one second? Yeah. In, in um, China, there's a saying, in crisis, there's opportunity. And I think there is a whole lot of opportunity going on right now. Uh, you guys are smart. You guys will make it happen. And if I can help you, let me know. Please join me in thanking Phil and uh, get the book signed. What's next? Right.